I'm going to talk about failure of retaining walls due to seismic loading. In this presentation, we'll go over objectives, key concepts, the potential failure modes and failure mechanisms, some case history, some key inputs and considerations, talk about um, how to calculate the loads on the structure, some uh, examples and how they compare to centrifuge tests and different experiences uh, on analyses. We're going to talk a little bit about finite element studies and how to evaluate this failure mode in the context of an event tree. The objectives today will be to understand the mechanisms that affect retaining wall failure under seismic loading, how to construct an event tree to represent the potential seismic retaining wall failure and the risks from this type of failure, and under, understand how to estimate the event tree probabilities and therefore the probability of having this failure mode occur at the project that you're evaluating. Some key concepts today. Uh, this potential failure mode typically relates to gated spillway crust structures and embankment dams where the spillway walls retain the embankment and the pool. So um, we're going to be discussing, so this failure mode as it relates to just concrete dams, we've discussed under the presentation for the pier failures or the tainer gate failure. So this case, it's um, a retaining wall failure that's retaining wall, uh, retaining the portion of the embankment behind it. The evaluation deals with the seismic response of reinforced concrete structures with the seismic load from the retained soil. So this um, presentation discusses a lot of the concepts that are also discussed in the reinforced concrete structures presentation and uh, best practices chapter. We'll discuss the methods to estimate seismic earthquake, seismic earth pressures and the wall response. And uh, because that's what's going to be driving the key, um, it's going to be driving the probabilities of failure in this case. So just like in the pier and in the gate, most of the walls that we're going to be evaluating weren't designed for these loads, but they do have some reserve capacity. So we'll have to, uh, we'll be taking that into account. Uh, this is typically not an issue for uncontrolled spillways that don't have gates or that they don't have water that's stored against the spillway. So um, because there's no consequences if that were to, if there were to be a failure. So you have to have the pool for there to be an uncontrolled release of pool downstream. Uh, Counterforded walls pre present a special case due to their prevalence and multiple potential failure modes associated with these types of walls. So I'm going to be discussing those as well. Okay, so potential failure modes. Um, so we have um, these three different considerations to keep in mind as we're discussing this failure mode. Um, you can have multiple ways that the failure mode can fail due to a seismic load. First, you have the, the wall collapses, overturns from bearing capacity failure at the toe, or it slides along a re unreinforced lift joints or fails in shear and it fa failing adjacent, adjacent to the gate. Um, the wall can also deflect excessively, which damages the adjacent gate. And we discussed this in a little in a little bit more detail, probably in the peer evaluation, where um, you have deformation, you have a lot of concrete cracking, reinforcement yielding, and that deformation that occurs leads to a failure of the gate and uncontrolled release of pool. The third is where you have deflection or failure of your retaining wall that creates a seepage path behind the wall and allows um, piping to occur in the embankment. The first two potential failure modes discussed here could happen quickly and produce an outflow before the last potential failure mode can really fully develop. So the, the last one, the one that creates a seepage path, seepage path is more slowly occurring, but it can lead to a, a pretty large breach. This is just a um, graph, a sketch of that third uh, potential failure mode. It shows that a wall collapses and that leads to internal erosion of the adjacent embankment. Um, the one thing that is missing in this in this sketch is that you could have gates in the spillway bay in the spillway bays, and if you were to have failure of those gates due to failure of that wall, you would also need to include the breach through those gate bays as well in your total breach width. Case histories, some examples of where we've seen some maybe not um, 
some poor performance of retaining walls under seismic loading. Uh, we have uh, this dam um, that was impacted by the Futagawa fault rupture earthquake in 2016. Uh, there was significant damage to the retaining wall with offsets to the spillway, including this failure to, of the left retaining wall at is, as is shown here in this photo. The reservoir was full at the, t uh, full at the time of the earthquake, but was drained rapidly and no uncontrolled release of pool occurred. The next example is at Shikang Dam. Uh, Shikang Dam is a buttress gravity dam located on the Tachia River. And we've talked about this example in multiple presentations here for best practices. This dam is located about 30 miles north of the epicenter of the Chichi earthquake that occurred in 1999. There was a lot of damage to this dam during that earthquake. There was differential ground movement through the spillway, vertical displacement of 29 feet. Uh, peak horizontal accelerations were recorded near the dam of 0.6 G. The spillway chute panel wall failed during this 1999 earthquake, and failure appears to be uh, a sheer failure through the counterforts, but no specific details are available about the structure, so we can only infer from the photos that we have seen. There was uh, no loss of pool um, due to this case, so no breach of the dam per se, but it's still a very interesting case because of just what we're able to learn from it. So this slide here, this photo shows the failed uh, spillway chute wall. And from this photo, you can see the portion that has collapsed into the, into the spillway. And it looks like the counterforts can be clearly seen and what looks like shearing near the base. A portion of the sheared counterfort, as can be seen here in this circled area, remains. The next example is Austrian Dam Spillway. Uh, Austrian Dam is a 200 foot high embankment dam constructed in Los Gatos Creek near Los Gatos, California. The concrete spillway is located on the right abutment of the dam. The dam was subjected to the Loma Prieta earthquake of 1989 with an estimated peak horizontal ground acceleration of about 0.6 G. Uh, Austrian dam settled and spread with a maximum settlement of about 2.8 feet. And due to this spreading and settlement, there was some damage to the spillway. Um, the cutoff walls were loaded and displaced. The chute elongated about a foot as a result of the embankment deformation. There were up to six inch voids created upstream of the cutoff walls. The chute walls deflected inward and a potential seepage path was created uh, behind that wall due to that deflection. Uh, the reservoir was low at the time of the earthquake though, so that was good, uh, limiting the amount of damage that could occur due to that seepage path. Uh, this is the photo of some of the damage at uh, the spillway at Austrian Dam. This slideshow shows that cracking occurred in the spillway walls due to its elongation from the uh, adjacent earth movements. That's here shown on the left right here. And there was separation of the embankment from the spillway crest structure here on the right. So uh, some key inputs and considerations to keep in mind during this evaluation of this failure mode. So some of the key factors to consider when evaluating retaining walls is that the reservoir levels affect the loading on the wall, the access to water behind the wall, and the consequences of failure. So this is no different than any of the other seismic failure modes that we've discussed, where you need to have a joint loading probability of the reservoir and the seismic event. So mo a lot of times, that combination of load is going to be um, remote and allows you to screen out the failure mode, but there are considerations that need to be taken that it that may not be the case. Um, if the spillway is gated, additional hydrodynamic loads from the gates will be transferred to the retaining walls. Uh, that may be forces or loads that the retaining wall wasn't designed for originally. The wall geometry and reinforcement affects the dynamic response and the capacity of the wall as described in the section on the reinforced concrete. So again, if you have a stiffer wall, it's, um, it's gonna attract more load. If you have a more flexible wall, it may deflect more. But in this case, that additional deflection may open that seepage path behind the retaining wall. The seismic hazard 
uh, defines the loading on the wall. So it's going to give you the information on the return periods and the accelerations that we should be evaluating this load case for. Um, just like in the presentation for the piers, the spillway bridges and the hoist stack can provide support at the top of the wall, but it can also provide an additional inertial force on the wall itself. So you need to be able to consider both scenarios. And of course, the soil backfill controls the seismic earth pressures and become a key component of the evaluation of this structure. So um, just quickly to talk about the spillway hoist decks and bridges, you know, they're typically, bridges are typically provided across the top of the spillway crest structures. Um, but they may serve as struts at the top of the wall, and it, it could create a um, change in where the maximum moment occurs on the structure. But it could also provide additional inertial for, force on that wall. So it needs to be verified exactly how that bridge is behaving with the rest of the structure, and you might be able, you might have to do a sensitivity analysis to see how sensitive your risk is to those uh, assumptions on how that bridge is behaving. Uh, bracing by spillway gates. If you have a gated spillway, the spillway gates may add some bracing to the adjacent walls. However, the seals and the skin plate from the initial contact uh, provide little resistance, really. So, um, so more than likely, some significant deflection would need to be um, need to be occurring to mobilize the strength of those more robust members, like the girders. Um, the gate bracing is likely limited and could buckle from that force from the walls. So all these loads and how they these structures behave with one another at the time of the seismic event becomes really important. It may be that the retaining wall and the pier are adding additional loads on the gates that may fail the gate. So that is definitely something that needs to be considered. So I had mentioned counterforted walls. Uh, counterforts are concrete walls that extend into the soil to which the wall panels are attached. Uh, frictional resistance between the soil and the counterforts help keep the wall in place. Uh, these are typically used for wall heights exceeding 40 feet. Um, counterfort walls are prevalent um, and present a number of possible failure mechanisms. Uh, this slide shows the areas in red where failure can occur in a counterforted wall. The critical modes typically involve wall typically involve wall panels failing and bending through the moments or by pulling away from the counterforts and uh, base reinforcement connections. You can also have a shear failure through the base of the counterforts, but the base of the wall. Um, since the counterforts are confined by soil on both sides, it's unlikely that a complete failure simply due to bending of the counterforts will occur. However, if there's enough soil movement, bending of the counterforts could result in enough cracking that could exacerbate a shear failure. So definitely a lot of points that need to be evaluated in these type of structures. So moving on to the load on the structures and seismic earth pressures. Um, uh, it's a critical, it's the critical load on how these spillway walls are going to behave. Um, the properties of the wall backfill will determine the seismic earth pressure against this crest of the structure walls. The saturation level of the backfill will also have a big influence on the static and dynamic pressures on the wall and can be an indication of the, the ability of water to move through the soil Developing, developing a seepage path along the spillway crest. So uh, Rankin theory of earth pressures for active and passive conditions can be used to estimate the state of stress within a soil mass uh, because of the displacement of the wall into or away from the soil mass. So creating active or passive soil pressures, we can calculate what that pressure is due to the seismic, um, seismic loading. The shear stress at failure within the soil is defined by the more Coulomb shear strength relationship. It assumes that the ground and failure surfaces are straight planes, that the resultant force acts parallel to the backfill, and that there's no wall friction. The Coulomb theory provides a method of analysis that gives the resultant horizontal force on, retaining, on a retaining system for, for a sloped wall, for wall friction, and for a slope of a backfill. 
So it's um, usually it's very common. Typically, we use the Mononabi Okabe to uh, calculate the the seismic earth pressures. We can also use Woods solution. I'm going to be going into both of these uh, methods. Uh, first, we'll start off with the Mononabi Okabe. It's a pseudostatic approach to calculate earth pressures induced by earthquakes. Uh, one of the assumptions is that the wall is able to yield laterally to fully uh, enable active and passive pressures. The amount of movement required to mobilize active and passive pressures can be significant, especially on the passive side, and those are uh, included in the best practices chapter. Uh, the Mamonabi Okabe method is based on Kulup's wedge theory of static lateral earth pressures and was an, a, originally developed for gravity walls retaining cohesionless backfield materials. Uh, this method, along with its derivatives, has generally been the most commonly used approach to determine these uh, seismically induced lateral earth pressures. There are some limits on this uh, equation that I'll go into here in a little bit. And um, me, let me go into a little bit more about how these equations were developed. So this slideshow shows the test setup that was used to develop what has been known as the Mononabi Okabe seismic earth pressure theory. The experiments were performed by Mononabi support that supported the theory of Okabe, so that's why it's, it's named that. The research was performed in Japan after the 1923 earthquake. Uh, as part of the research, they performed physical experiments that, like we can see on this slide, the experiment was performed using a rigid, small-scale 1G shake table. The nine foot long by four foot wide by four foot sand boxes that contain the relatively loose and dry sands were set on rollers as shown here in the figure. You can see it here. And a winch driven by a 30 horsepower electric motor was used to provide the horizontal simple harmonic motion of the shake table. Hydraulic pressure gauges at the top of the sand boxes measured the, results, the resulting seismic earth pressures. So um, the Mononabi Okabe theory includes the effect of earthquakes through the use of constant horizontal accelerations and constant vertical accelerations. Um, the theory assumes that wall movements are sufficient, like I said, to fu fully mobilize the shear resistance along the backfill wedge failure surface. The amount of displacement required to mobilize that active and passive pressures again, can be significant, and um, you can that is included in the best practices chapter for this section. Uh, using this equation, it gives you a net static and dynamic force, so make sure that you're not adding in the static force once you use this equation to calculate the forces on the retaining wall. So this is the equation for estimating the seismic earth pressure using this method. Details for estimating this uh, can be found in the best practices manual. These equations can be easily programmed into a spreadsheet and distributions can be assigned to the input parameters. So you can do a probabilistic analysis using Monte Carlo analyses or a first order second moment analysis. So, you know, I've talked a little bit about what the assumptions are for the Mononabi Akabi theory. You have a yielding back, a, a yielding wall with active pressures. You have a cohesionless backfill. You have soil that satisfies the more column failure criterion. A failure plane in the backfill occurs along the inclined angle and it passes through the toe of the wall. You don't have liquefaction in that soil during the seismic event. The soil wedge behaves as a rigid body and accelerations are constant through that mass and the backfill is completely above or completely below the water table. But there is a limitation to how and when you can use Mononabi Okabe. Um, this formula increases exponentially and the radical goes negative when phi is greater than or equal to psi. Psi is the seismic inertial angle. So this usually occurs uh, around uh, peak horizontal ground accelerations of 0.7 G. So once you get to really high seismic accelerations, the, uh, the spreadsheet blows up and doesn't give you uh, good data. So when that happens, you need to move on to the Woods solution. So we'll talk a little bit about that and how those that was developed. 
Uh, would evaluated dynamic earth pressures for wall retaining non-yielding backfills. So in, instead of Mononavio Cavi, which was yielding backfills, assuming elastic materials. Therefore, it assumes small displacements and may not be suitable when evaluating a failure condition where you're expecting larger displacements. Wood solution excites a finite length, homogeneous elastic soil, as we can see here. So it has a finite length. Um, it, it excites it along its base and its two vertical rigid boundaries. So here's the base and here are the two rigid walls. For a perfectly rigid wall supporting a relatively long layer of soil would determine that the that the earthquake force computed was likely greater than what was expected using the mononavio cavi the uh, equations, sometimes two to three times greater. So this is looked as a generally conservative approach to calculate uh, earthquake earth pressures. This method is recommended for rigid walls embedded in very firm soil or in rock. Uh, would establish that dynamic amplification is, insignif is insignificant for relatively low frequency ground motions. Therefore, this solution is limited to ground motion frequencies that are less than half the natural frequency of the backfill. So here are the equations for estimating the seismic loads and the shape of the stress distribution using Wood's solution. Uh, details uh, and getting into uh, more uh, analysis details can be found in the best practices manual. But again, these equations can be used similarly to the Mononabi Okabi, Okabi very easily in a probabilistic analysis by including them in the spreadsheet and um, just using equations to program them in. So a couple things to note here is uh, that it gives you a parabolic stress distribution. So compare that to the Mononabio Kabi, that is more of a linear distribution, and the um, wood solution tends to be more conservative. It's a function of the soil's Poisson's ratio and a function of the L over H ratio, and it gives you normalized solutions. So moving on to centrifuge tests and other experiments. So research was done by Sitar and Alatik um, they did some centrifuge modeling of retaining walls at, conducted at the University of California at Davis with the focus primarily on seismic earth pressures. So two different walls were tested in the centrifuge runs. One was a flexible wall, one was a stiffer wall. The U-shaped retaining wall structures were placed side by side in the model container with soil placed underneath and behind each of the walls to form that U-shaped retaining structure. Sensors were used to monitor the lateral earth pressures on the wall. Strain gauges were used to determine bending moments in the wall. And then this information was used to back calculate the earth pressures and were compared to finite element models as well. Direct measurements of the total moments at the bases of the walls were made using force sensing bolts. So let's discuss, okay, so this is the setup of the centrifuge. The U-shaped walls were modeled with sand backfill. Um, one side had a stiff wall set up and the other, so you can see here, the other wall, uh, the other side had the flexible wall set up and it was subjected to various earthquake loads. So some of the key findings from this research that was conducted was that the wall inertial moments contribute to the overall dynamic wall moments, and that contribution is substantial, and it needs to be accounted for. So wall inertia needs to be included when you calculate the soil, uh, when you're calculating the, the moments due to seismic loads on a retaining wall structure. Um, the wall inertial moments are generally in phase with the dynamic wall moments. Uh, the maximum earth pressures, though, and the maximum wall moments are generally out of phase, like is shown in this, in this graph here. This was the case for both the stiff and the flexible walls. The earth pressure distributions were found to be triangular, increasing from no pressure at the top of the backfill to maximum pressure at the base of the wall. So more similar to Mononabi Okabe, 
than what the wood solution uh, predicts. Uh, the earth pressures on the walls were less than those predicted by Mononavi Okabe, and the difference was greater for more flexible walls than for the stiffer walls. So this is just an example of how the uh, centrifuge case uh, results compared to the Mononabi Okabe. The, um, the dark black line is Mononabi Okabe, and you can see that those um, results were greater than the results from the centrifuge testing, but they do follow that triangular pressure distribution instead of that parabolic pressure distribution that was seen in the Woods method. So finite element studies and how those compared. So the top figure here, the solid line is the Berkeley centrifuge experimental results. The dashed line is the Berkeley finite element results. Here in the bottom is a Bureau of Reclamation Elastina analysis results using a nonlinear soil property. And you can see here from these comparisons that the finite element analysis properly captures the behavior of the wall, but maybe slightly conservative. So the keys to this uh, to this time history approach using finite element analysis is to model the soil with a nonlinear soil properties so that the soil can yield and to model the appropriate contact surface between the wall and the soil backfill. Um, when comparing the centrifuge test to the finite element test, um, the results were somewhat a little bit closer for the flexible wall. Those, those are not shown here in this, uh, in this uh, slide. So it should be noted that if you're going into the approach and the path of doing finite element analysis, it's considerably more time consuming and costly than simplified approaches and should really only be considered for critical cases where the geometry is considerably different than those represented by these uh, more simplified approaches, or uh, if a simplified linear elastic method shows that the wall is likely to fail, producing high risks and high consequences, and you're going in the direction of having to modify the dam. Um, when you're doing finite element analyses, though, it requires um, quite a bit from pretty extensive validation and sensitivity analysis, and they are critical to make sure that those are done and included and that nonlinear properties of the structure are modeled as well. So um, I'm going to give you here an example of a finite element analysis that was done on an embankment wall system. It was done by Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, the full embankment dam and foundation was included in the model, um, including nonlinear um, material properties. The reinforced concrete was modeled and allowed to crack. The reinforcement was allowed to yield. Uh, what they found was that the crust structure, even though there was a lot of cracking and reinforcement yielding, it did not collapse. There was not these uh, large areas of reinforcement rupture. Uh, the soil was also modeled with nonlinear material properties, so the soil can yield. Uh, contact surfaces were provided between the wall and the soil backfill, and a significant amount of effort was put into verifying and testing this model. Sensitivity analysis, lots of sensitivity analysis were done to be able to properly verify and be able to have some amount of confidence in the results of the model output. So this, this example um, here, you can see this is the, the um, uh, finite element model. You can see that there was lots of cracking and all the concrete pattern in the concrete in the counterforts and um, you could see that there was lots of steel yielding, but again, you didn't have a collapse of the wall. The analysis indicated that walls would crack, but they would remain stable and that the displacements would actually be pretty limited with no separation from the soil embankment behind it. The earth pressures that were calculated by the finite element model were actually in between the Mononavi Okabe expected earth pressures and the woods expected. Uh, earth pressures. 
So uh, while CITAR and ALATIC research indicates that accepted methods may overstate earth pressure loads on walls, let's just remember that the, um, you know, there have been examples in finite element analyses that those earth pressure uh, earth pressure loads can actually be greater than the Mononabi Okabe and maybe in between those two. So they don't necessarily quite match the output from those centrifuge tests that I showed you earlier. So some of the primary differences between these centrifuge tests and FLAC or ls finite element analysis is the various geometries and the backfill conditions on these different crest structures. Uh, the different foundation conditions and finite element studies have indicated that earth pressures uh, uh, can approach passive conditions adjacent to rock abutments. So this is an example of an event tree. You've probably seen this event tree multiple times during the this week um, because it's the, the same one that you would see under reinforced concrete failure mechanisms and under the pier failure under seismic loading. Um, so a couple things to remember. So, you know, you're looking at various reservoir and seismic load ranges that need to be considered. The event tree, again, is modeled after the information that is presented under the reinforced concrete chapter. So again, the concrete, you have to evaluate whether the concrete cracks, whether the reinforcement yields, whether you exceed the shear capacity of the uh, section, whether you're exceeding the moment capacity of the section. And in each of those cases, you also have to evaluate, in this case, how much displacement you're getting of that wall and whether you're um, initiating that third failure mechanism or failure mode of having that open seepage path now adjacent to your embankment. So some key takeaway points. Uh, gated spillway walls retaining embankment soils are subject to increased loading during earthquake shaking that many times they weren't designed uh, to, they weren't accounted for, they weren't designed for. Sometimes they were designed for seismic accelerations, but those seismic accelerations were likely much smaller than what we would be evaluating under a risk evaluation and under the context uh, that we're discussing this today. If water is being stored against the gates at the time of the earthquake, potential failure modes and consequences exist. If you don't have water on your spillway, if you have damage to the spillway, there's no uncontrolled release of pool. So your consequences are gonna be limited to the damage to the structure and to economic damages, but you're not gonna have the, that loss of life due to the uh, uncontrolled release of pool. If the loading causes excessive deformation or collapse of the wall, the adjacent gate could also fail or and you could have breach through the gate bay or you can have that open opening of the seepage path behind the wall adjacent to the embankment dam which might take a lot longer to develop but it could be a much a much larger breach condition than potentially you would have against or within the gate bay so that is something to, to remember and consider an evaluation of the stability of these walls including seismic earth pressures is often needed to evaluate the risk posed by these potential failure modes. So just remember, it's, it's very hard to um, qualitatively assess these structures, especially when the loading that we're evaluating it to is so much greater than what the structures were designed for. So sometimes that evaluation, those um, simple spreadsheet-based evaluations can give you a lot of information as to how much more load, how much more demand you have on your structure than capacity. And that's, uh, it can give you pretty vital information as to um, whether you might require additional analysis to determine if the dam would need to be modified or not. So here is an example uh, of a uh, retaining wall under seismic loading. Um, I, you can go through this yourself. I, I won't go through this uh, point by point, um, but in this example, we're asking you to calculate the lateral earth pressure due to seismic load at these different recurrence intervals. And uh, so these different ground accelerations, assuming the conditions that we've presented. So this goes through that calculation and then it calculates the shear at the base of the wall. 
and we're assuming that we have a shear capacity of 200 pounds per square inch at the base, and then for different uh, seismic accelerations, these are the conditions that, uh, or these are the uh, shears that we're expecting. So just one of the things to point out here is that you can see that the expected probability of failure was estimated to be pretty low as the accelerations remain on the low side and you have a pretty low shear stra stress at the base of the wall. But as those shear stresses approach your uh, capacity of 200, so we're here at like 185, you start a, a, um, eliciting some or, or the team agrees that there is some probability of failure due to unknowns at this site, due to maybe um, material properties, um, uncertainty in the loading, um, uncertainty in the behavior of the structure, you know, all those things. And then the probability gets significantly higher once you've exceeded that shear capacity of 200. And in this case, um, that happens above a 10,000 year event. And at 50,000 year event, you're at uh, 233.